Hello, my name is Will Dean. I am the Forest author. Today, I want to do a big video on literary agents, how to get one. This is going to be a big FAQs, tips and tricks type video. So welcome back. I hope you are well. I'm good. I'm here in the forest trying to write, trying to edit, and I want to give you some guidance on agents and finding one. Um, it's a strange time right now, of course, and you might be wondering to yourself if you have a work in progress or if you're working on a novel, is this a good time to get a literary agent? Is this a good time to submit? Should I hold off querying? And my advice would be... Wait a second. Whew, I'm sorry about that. I had to run out into the forest to get my Saint Bernard, who is very mischievous, mischievous. He's a naughty boy. He's a big. He's a big guy. He's about sixty kilos now. He likes to chase after deer. He doesn't chase after moose, but he does kind of seek them out. He's a good dog. Um, he's a handful. Querying right now, being in the query trenches. Uh, at some point through an epidemic, a pandemic. Is this a good idea? Is it a good idea to query your books? I think it is. Um, I know a lot of literary agents and quite a few of them are like actively seeking submissions right now. They want to work, they want to read, they want to find new clients, they know just as well as you know and I know that at some point life will go back to normal, even if that's a kind of a new normal, and people want books, and agents want new clients, they want new authors. So if their lists are open, I would say submit to them. If you've written a great book, you will pick up an agent. So in general, you know, if you ask, is publishing alive right now? It's it's alive, just very strange time. A lot of bookshops are closed. So independent bookshops, especially, are having a really difficult time. Authors with books out now are having a difficult time. But the industry publishing will just go ahead because there's such a huge amount of time lags built into the system. So if I'm working on a book now, I'm just about to start in May, uh, Tuva Moodison book five. That won't be out until 2022. So you kind of have to just work on what you're working on. And then it won't reach the public anyway for a couple of years. So it, is publishing alive? Yes. Are editors uh, reading work from agents that agents send them? Yes, they are. Are books going to auction right now in the middle of all of this? Yes, they are. Uh, it's, it's all... It's all still working, it's just being done from home, being done remotely, um, but it's not a reason, I don't think, to stop submitting or to not query the agents that you wanna query. So this is like a bunch of random questions that I've written down. Should you, as a author, as a writer, submit your first draft to an agent or submit your like 50th draft to an agent? I kind of think neither is the right thing to do. You should definitely not submit your first draft to anyone. I don't let anybody read my first draft, ever. Uh, my wife gets to read my like 10th draft, but I do a lot of drafts, I do a lot of rewriting because my first draft is such a quick process. But ideally, I think you should send your like third, fifth, 10th draft to an agent. It needs to be sent at the point at which you cannot improve it anymore. You start, you're just kind of getting snow blindness when you're looking at the page. Your first draft is written kind of for you to get the story out of your out of your system. The second draft, the third draft, the fourth draft, they're all you refining it, working out exactly who these characters are, fine-tuning the whole thing, making the rhythm of the prose better. Um, the voice is probably there in the first draft, 
but you might be refining the plot and making that make more sense. You might have a main character called Ian in chapter three and by chapter 20, his name's Bill. You know, that happens in all of our drafts. So don't send an agent the first draft. That's just too, it's not going to be good enough at that point, but don't wait until you've written 50 drafts over 10 years because at a certain point, you're not really improving it. You're just tinkering. So you want to query before that point because your agent is probably going to have a lot of feedback and go through some kind of editorial process with you. And then when it gets sold to a publisher, they will go through an editorial process. So stop tinkering, but do self-edit. So self-edit a few times and then start querying. If you have queried agents with a manuscript, when to chase? Normally I would say like six to eight weeks is fine for a polite business-like chaser. Right now, maybe you want to stretch that a little bit further because there's a lot of people who have other priorities right now, just real life stuff. So maybe 10, 12 weeks or something like that. But it's always fine to send a chaser. Always fine. As long as all of your correspondence to agents is professional, it's polite, uh, business-like, you can never really go wrong. They're not likely to be pissed off with you sending a polite short email after eight weeks. If they are, maybe they're not an agent you want to work with. So I would say always find to send a chaser. Don't be surprised if your chaser doesn't get answered ever or doesn't get answered for a while. Agents are incredibly busy people, um, but it's fine to send one. Okay, another question I see quite a lot is if I've submitted to a particular agent two years ago with a book and now two years later, I've rewritten that book a bunch of times. It's kind of very different to the book that I originally submitted and that was rejected. Can I resubmit that work? The answer is absolutely you can but check the agent's guidelines, the agency's guidelines, because some of some agents specifically don't want to receive a new version of a book they've already rejected. But many don't mind. Many are quite happy to receive a new version. I'm not talking about like a book where you've been through a spell check since it was rejected. I'm talking about something that has to be kind of materially rewritten in some way and improved upon. Um, but it's always fine to do that and most agents won't mind receiving it. A general tip in terms of how do I get a book finished? If you're stuck at the middle mark, and all authors pretty much get stuck in the middle, you get a crisis of confidence, you're worried about the middle not being so exciting because you have your opening in your head before you start, you have your finale maybe in your head before you start, but the middle bit is always challenging. So do not lose faith. My biggest tip is if you're in the middle of a book and you're worried, and you're starting to regret decisions or you're starting to rethink the whole thing, just forge ahead and take this with a pinch of salt because every author needs to find their own process. But I would say forge ahead. It's not good to kind of interrogate your own work while you're writing it. It's like, I don't think it's useful to go back and edit your work when you're in the middle of a story. Get the story out of you as a as a person. Get that story down and then you can tinker with it and edit it and rewrite it later on. Once you have it down, you have something to play with. You have something to work with. This is how I do this, okay? And this is just massively a confidence trick. I spend months and months and months visualizing. So, so first of all, I have an idea, like a seed of an idea, which is normally a scenario. Where it's a thing that happens to a particular character. And then I spend months and months visualizing how this pans out, how this affects the characters. I come up with the kind of general mood, the general atmosphere, the time of year, that kind of thing. So I understand the world around this scenario, this story. I might not understand the plot at this point and what happens in the story, but I understand the setting. And the setting and the sense of place for me is really important. And then I, I kind of lead myself up to the point where I'm ready to start on page one. And that those few intense weeks before I start a first draft involve really heavy visualization. I want to see the story. I do want to see some of the plot points, not all of them, but I want to understand some of the key plot points at the third way mark or the halfway mark, because that enables me to have some kind of skeleton that I can hang the story on. It gives me confidence. Once again, it's all a confidence trick. It's all about me feeling like I can do it because oftentimes I worry I can't do it. I still find 100,000 new words daunting. I still find the prospect of coming up with a new story which is compelling, which has conflict and tension, which is interesting, which moves readers, a huge challenge. I find it really difficult to write books. 
I love writing books, I find it really difficult. That's what I'm juggling with here. Um, so in terms of finishing your manuscript, I get to that point where I'm visualizing, I see the story and then I, I commit and I sit down and I start writing and I write the first draft in four weeks, which is an extreme process, which I'm not recommending to anyone or everyone or anyone. Uh, it's a weird process at which I, you know, I'm exhausted when it's finished, but I've got it down. And then I put it in a drawer for a few months, I work on something else, I come back to it with fresh eyes. And I'm usually terrified at that point that it's going to be garbage. I, I've always talked myself into at that point that it's rubbish and it, it will need throwing away. And then I sit down and read it and I find out it's fine and it will be great. I just need to work on it a lot for many, many months and a huge, ridiculous amount of hours. And I will get it to a good point. But writing that first draft is a confidence trick. I need to get through it. I need constant momentum and speed pushing me forwards so I don't look back. Because if I look back, I will give up on it. I will give up on myself and my career. I'm, I'm not joking here. I have to forge ahead so I don't look back. But this is just me. Every author has their own myriad anxieties and this is one of mine. My tip for finishing your manuscript is just get it done. Get it finished, get it to the end point. A lot of writers don't finish their work, they don't finish their books and they have lots of unwritten manuscripts. Get to the end and then deal with it. You need something to be able to work with. You can't edit a blank page, so get to the end and then you have something uh, that you can get your teeth into. And the editing process is totally different for most authors than the first draft process. The first draft process for me is a wild, emotional, almost zombie-like, almost... almost kind of transcendental or dreamlike phase. And like I say, this is not for everyone. Everyone has a different uh, process, a different way to do this. But my first draft phase is very odd. I go through a lot of emotions. And then when it's done, my editing phase, my rewriting phase is much more businesslike and normal and human, uh, which my wife is happy about. I'm much more of a normal person. And I sit down, you know, nine to five or whatever. And I go through and I write charts and I try and pick apart the plot and I try to understand the characters and I work on it and work on it and work on it and work on it, hone it, hone it, hone it, get it to a point where I'm happy with it. But that, for me, the trick of finishing a book is not looking back. All right, I appreciate I'm jumping around here a lot, but when you have submitted and you've been rejected by lots and lots of agents, dozens and dozens of agents, when to move on, when to quit that book and move on. I see a lot of authors who have a book and they're querying for, for years and years with the same book. And that can be dangerous for a few different reasons. One is you're not working on other things or it's unlikely you're working on other things. Two is it's easy to get dispirited and, and to lose your confidence if you're getting rejected for years. Three is at some point you need to read the signals and write something else. Authors need to write more than one book. There's very few authors out there who have made a career out of one book. You know, there are a few, but most of us need to write a book every three years, a book every two years, a book every year, a book every six months even. So if you've been rejected by everyone, or almost everyone, the best thing to do, I think, is to put that book in a drawer and start work on the next thing. I did this. I wrote an awful book. <laughs> I submitted it everywhere. I got rejected everywhere. Uh, and I decided to write Dark Pines because that b other book was getting close to being accepted by agents. It was getting a lot of full requests and I knew it wasn't good enough to be my debut. So I put it in a drawer and I started work on Dark Pines. And that feeling of I can write more than one book, first of all, was a good feeling. Second of all, I can use all the lessons that I've learned from trying to write that terrible book and trying to submit that terrible book. I can draw upon all of that. And those lessons are hard learnt. Like they are, it's not someone in a fancy writing course telling me, it's me being here in the woods, being rejected day after day for months, for years, and knowing that that book wasn't quite right. I can tap into all of that to try and make Dark Pines, or I did to try and make Dark Pines a much better book. And I'm glad I moved on. And, and 
ultimately what I think is if you move on and you write another book and that gets picked up by an agent and you still think that the original book locked in a drawer is actually good give it to your agent let them decide if you can do something with it personally I have my other book locked in a drawer I think my agent would quite like to read it I'm not going to show it to her because it's not a good book I'm not happy with it I wouldn't want it to be published so don't ever let the fact that you have a book and you're worried about all that time and effort going to waste, don't let that feeling stop you from writing the next book and the next book and the next book. A lot of authors get published or get picked up by an agent on their fifth book, on their third book, on their eighth book. Keep writing different things. Learn the lessons from the book before and keep moving forwards. Moving forwards is a big thing for me. I, If I have a big success, if I have something picked up by a TV company, if I have... Um, you know, great sales or something or a wonderful review. I don't, I, I, I focus on that for one second and then I move on because it's all in the past. It's something I wrote three years ago at this point. So I'm always looking at the next thing uh, or what I'm writing now, which will be published in a couple of years time. That's what I'm excited about. I kind of almost ignore what's happened before, what's happening now. I'm always about the future because I want to keep moving forwards. It's again, it's that confidence trick. I don't want to look behind me. I want to look in front of me. Comp titles. Some writers ask me, should I use comp titles in my cover letter to agents? And how should I use comp titles? And it's a really good question. I personally love comp titles. I think they're really helpful in giving a kind of a shortcut uh, clue to the agent or to an editor about where your book would sit in the market and what kind of book it is. So I find them really useful. At the same time as finding them really useful, I find them extremely challenging to do well. And I see a lot of really bad examples of comp titles being used. So if you're writing a middle grade book and you compare it to Harry Potter, I think most agents would just roll their eyes. If you're writing a dystopian thriller and you compare it to The Road, it's just a, it's a big ask. It's a big, it's a big thing to say in a cover letter. And agents like to see that you're confident in your work, but they don't want to see hubris. They like to see that you're confident in your work, but they also want to see that you're well read and that you know uh, books apart from the obvious books. So I say use comp titles, but maybe put a little extra work into your comp title choices. So if you if you're coming up with a book that is an obvious book that you think a lot of other authors would choose, take some element of that book out and compare some element of your book to that famous book. Does that make sense? So don't just say that your book is like Jurassic Park. Talk about the, uh, I don't know, the plot structure or the characterization or world building or something of this meets the, uh, the voice of this other book. And that will get you some brownie points with an agent because it just shows you put a little bit of extra thought into it and that you've, you've read a little bit more widely than the average person submitting. Word count. Okay, word count. You can find these things pretty readily available online through hashtag ask agent or through writers and artists yearbook and that kind of thing. But generally in terms of word count, try and stay roughly within the normal parameters because what you're working on is a piece of art, but eventually it's going to become a product. And for you as a writer, it is a piece of art, it's a piece of literature. But in terms of the end result, it's going to be a consumable product, if you like. Although that sounds really weird coming out of my mouth, but it kind of is. Like it needs to, it can't be a two million word novel. It's just not going to work. And it can't be a 50 word novel, right? It has to be within the realms of, of uh, expectations. So I would say like for a crime thriller, your your minimum normally is kind of 75, 80,000. Your maximum is kind of 120, 125. And most thrillers are 85 to 110-ish, I would say. Uh, you can go higher than that for things like fantasy and science fiction, and you want to come a little lower for things like YA probably and middle grade. So I'm no expert in word count. Like, ask agents, uh, ask, uh, Google it, <laughs> find guidelines from people who know what they're talking about. But I would say don't go wildly away from the expected word count. It's going to 
throw up a red flag to any literary agent. If you've written a middle grade novel and it's 300,000 words, that agent is instantly, even if they love you, they love the first few pages, they're instantly going to think, this is going to be a lot of work to, to get this down to a manageable size. Uh, if you've written a science fiction fantasy novel and it is 55,000 words, again, red flags. It's going to probably worry some literary agents and you don't want red flags in your submission package you want your submission pack submission submission package to be as attractive as possible right you you want it to be okay good 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 fine fine good good and then the agent looks at your first 30 pages or first 50,000 words or whatever it is 50,000 words 10,000 words 10,000 words so you want your Submission package, the synopsis needs to be like business-like and professional and spell out what happens in the story and include things like the main character and the setting and the main conflict. But it has to be, you know, focus on just the bare bones of the story and say what happens during the story. The cover letter needs to be more of a sales pitch type letter. Go back through my videos. I read through my actual query letter that got me an agent. Go find that video and you will see how I wrote my uh, submission letter, my cover letter. But the cover letter needs to have like a little, a passage about the book, the genre, the word count, the title, uh, a little pitch of the book, if you like, a little blurb, a few sentences selling the book to the agent. Uh, that needs to be exciting, it needs to be compelling. Then you need to do a few lines about yourself, uh, maybe some comp titles where the book would fit in the market. But it needs to be really brief and succinct, something where an agent who's really busy, who's on the tube or who's, you know, at home on the weekend will read it in a minute and think, looks fine, looks professional. This is, this letter gives a vibe that I could work with this person. If an agent would get a five page cover letter and it goes on and on and on about, you know, how good you were at netball or football at school and you won this thing and it's just... Instantly, I think most agents would think this could be not ideal working with this author. So be succinct, be empathetic to the agent. The ag agents receive so many submissions. Try and keep it really brief and punchy so it has impact. You want that synopsis and that cover letter to be impactful, brief, as good as they can be, so that the agent then moves on to your first page of your sample chapters. And then it's all about, obviously, them falling in love with your writing and with your book. Social media, do agents expect you to have 100,000 Instagram followers? Do they expect you to have a, a glossy website? Do they expect you to have your own YouTube channel? The answer is absolutely 100% not. No agent will turn down a great book and a great prospective author because they have zero social media presence. It's all about the book. It's all about that writing ability. All the other stuff, all the social media stuff can come later on. I remember doing an event, I think it was about, was it two years ago? Yeah, January 2018. I did an event in Brixton and I was there with some other authors, CJ Tudor, uh, Fiona Mitchell, Emma Glass, and Tara Westover. And I remember, I didn't know, I'd never heard of Tara Westover. Her book, Educated, had not come out at that point. It was a few months before publication. And she had like, I don't know, 100 Twitter followers. She clearly had focused on the book, on her kind of memoir, rather than on her Twitter profile. And now she has, you know, 55,000 followers. And it's not because she's great on Twitter. It's because she wrote an incredibly powerful book. Does it matter if you've already been self-published? Not really, is what I would say. If the book that you are submitting to an agent has already been self-published, that can cause problems. If the book has been self-published and it's sold in enormous numbers, then a publisher or an agent might think, how am I going to find more readers for this book if it's already been read by everyone? If it's been self-published and it's found no readers, then an agent or publisher might think, well... It's kind of been tested on the market already. But if you're an author who has self-published work previous to this book, other books, and uh, they've done what they've done, they've done well, they've done badly, whatever, it doesn't really matter so much because if you're submitting a book that has never been published before, traditionally or self-published, 
that's a kind of new proposition for an agent and an agent is going to be excited about that book and will build a career upon the foundations upon the the kind of basics that they see present in that book and i'm talking about you as a storyteller you as an author is it essential that you have been on an expensive creative writing course in london or an mfa in new york is it important that you have won a lot of writing competitions and prizes and that kind of thing it is of zero importance if you can demonstrate something in your cover letter i'm talking about one line which sh shows that you're taking writing seriously that can be really helpful whether that says you've been on a course or you've been to a festival or that you have read a particular book about writing or that blah 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 like if you can demonstrate in one line it should be like just one short line that you are taking this seriously that can be helpful but you don't need to have spent ten thousand pounds on a course i'd never been on a writing course partly because you know i had no money back then and partly because i live in a bog <laughs> in sweden moose infested swamp in the forest so i'd never been on a course I'd never won a prize. I was just a secret writer. You know, I was a, I was a, a dude uh, with a weird imagination just trying to write stories on his own. And I took my lessons, if you like, from reading good authors. Um, I've been a big reader all my life and that was my MFA. That was my creating writing, creative writing course. However, I had been to a festival in York twice. It's like a two or three day festival. In York. So I put that in my cover letter. I think it was like half a line on the cover letter. Really, really succinct. And hopefully that triggered with some agents. Okay, he's, you know, he's invested a little bit of time and money into this. He's, he's, he's been to uh, a festival. But I'd never been, I'd never done a, an expensive course. And you don't need to have done either. It is not essential. What is essential is your storytelling. That is essential. And some people are great storytellers with having done courses and some people are great storytellers without having to have done courses. Okay, here's a good one. Here is a good one. Here is something I get asked a lot, which is, how do you really get your agent? Did you have contacts? Did you know someone? Or are you really a slush pile find? And the truth is I'm 100% genuinely a slush pile find. I had no contacts. I didn't know any agents at all. I was submitting blindly to slush piles and hoping that an agent would find my manuscript. That is the truth. And um, furthermore, that is the reality. That is the truth for pretty much every author I know. They're all slush pile babies. All of them. Like a couple of authors, especially people with high profiles, maybe like well-known journalists, they'll get agents without having to go through the slush pile. But most fiction authors get an agent via the slush pile, via sending off into the ether an email with two attachments, you know, a cover letter, no, three attachments, a cover letter, a synopsis and sample pages, or maybe two attachments if the cover letter is in the body of the email. Always check the agent's submission guidelines. That is very, very important. That is a red flag straight away if you completely disregard what they've asked for. Always tailor your submission to that particular agent. Always. Don't send out 100 emails to 100 agents with Dear Sir Madam. Like, put some effort into this. You've written a bloody book. That was the difficult part. So now don't do shortcuts, you know. Tailor. Make sure you get the name right. Make sure you 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 um, look up their submission package guidelines and you follow them and make sure you tailor your cover letter in some way to that agent even if it means half a line or one line the fact that they represent a particular author that you've read and that you admire or the fact that you noticed that they were participating in a really interesting auction the year before for a particular book that you loved put that in something that shows that you've done some research on the agent and you're actually genuinely interested in that particular specific agent but i cannot emphasize enough the slush pile works 
I know a lot of authors, I'm friends with a lot of authors, and they all were discovered via the slush pile. And there, there are authors right now, there are writers right now in the world being discovered right now in slush piles. So believe in the slush pile. It's, the odds are not good. It's a difficult process, but it can be done. So believe in the slush pile. Okay, here's the thing that I struggled with, which is what is voice? What do agents mean when they're looking for voice-driven stories or they're looking for a unique voice? When I was submitting my terrible book, some agents were saying to me that I'm really interested in voice. I'm, I'm looking for uh, a new kind of voice. And I was like, well, what is voice? What, what does that mean? And eventually I figured it out. And I think it can be demonstrated easiest if you look at particular books with a very strong voice. So if one, one of my favorite authors is Cormac McCarthy, author of The Road, No Country for Old Men, Blood Meridian. If you read his books, he has a very distinctive voice and a very distinctive writing style. You instantly know, know, even if you don't have a cover on your book, that it's a Cormac McCarthy novel. Stephen King has this very unique voice to him as well, which is, you know, you start reading a Stephen King novel and you get this unnerving feeling, first of all, that something's not quite right. You get this slow burning, really in-depth introduction to every character. You understand what motivates these characters. These characters jump off the page. They feel very real. And the language, which is often kind of small town descriptions interspersed with a lot of humour, a lot of warmth, it's just very distinctive to him. I don't know. You can't really... Even now I'm having trouble describing what the voice is, but Stephen King's books all have a very distinctive voice. Uh, Gillian Flynn has this very sharp, almost acidic, very beautiful observations. Her voice is very, very distinctive as well. You know a Gillian Flynn novel when you pick one up. Uh, kind of like the Cool Girl monologue from Gone Girl. That's a good example of her voice. If you read uh, someone like Max Porter, his his books have a very distinctive, almost poetic slash prose kind of style, which is very, very unusual and powerful. And he's he's very true to how he wants to write a book. And you, that really comes through. Same thing if you read... Um, if you read Abhya Mukherjee, you really see his voice coming through in every single book in the Sam Wyndham series. You see that he writes this very evocative 1920s India setting beautifully. And he mixes, he managed to, manages to mesh kind of historical social commentary about imperialism and about colonialism in with this zoomed in crime stories um, in such a beautiful way, in such a natural way. Uh, he's very good at that. Train Spotting is another book with a, with a really strong voice. Uh, Emma Glass, one of the writers I was just talking about actually, who wrote Peach, her voice is incredibly distinctive. George Saunders, who won the Man Book Prize last year, two years ago. Uh, fantastic voice. But what is voice? I, I mean, it's just the way you write, really. It's, it's your personal kind of individual fingerprint. It's the way you tell a story. And that comprises of things like the rhythm of your prose and the, the pace of your storytelling and the way that you weave descriptions into action. It's, it's a lot of different things, but voice is... If you nail your voice, if you get your voice right when you're writing, that's what pulls a reader through the whole book. It's So right now I'm reading um, Neon Rain by James Lee Burke, and it's a really interesting, brilliant book. But the, the scenes where nothing is happening, his voice is so strong and his writing is so excellent that I am extremely compelled to keep reading when there's two dudes in a diner or, or two women in a car talking. Those scenes are so well done that I want to move forward. It's like The Wire. If you look at The Wire, if you watch The Wire. If you walk through the garden. You the writing on The Wire is fantastic. And you, you see 
a particular scene, which is very exciting. There's a lot of things happening. Great. But then in the next scene, you see two people on a bench talking. And the writing is so good. The writing is so, so good. The voice is so strong that you would watch that scene for 12 hours <laughs> with nothing happening. Maybe I need to do a better video on voice and actually give it some thought and come up with some coherent ideas, but that's what I've got to say right now in voice. How to write a synopsis. I've done a video on this already, so go find it if you need to know how to write a synopsis. But I would say keep it brief, one to two pages. I like one page, I like a one page synopsis. Uh, you have to say everything that happens in the book, all the major plot points, all the major developments. It needs to show the general kind of macro arc of the story. You need to introduce a couple of main characters. Do not try and introduce all of your characters. Do not try and explain all of your subplots. Do not even try and explain the whole of the main plot. You need to know the kind of the skeleton of the story, the main characters. You need to explain the main conflict and you need to give up the ending in some way. Although that's a controversial point because some authors don't give out the ending, the true ending in a synopsis. I think if you've written a whodunit, you don't necessarily have to explain who actually done it. Some, some agents want to see that, some agents don't want to see that. Most agents, I would say, probably do, especially in a submission uh, package because they want to see that you can end a book uh, in a way that they think is a, is, a, is a good way. Should you pay money? Should you pay money to get your book professionally edited before you submit to an agent? This is kind of a difficult one. Uh, it's kind of a personal thing. There are plenty of authors out there who got agents without having to do this. I think it's good to get somebody to read your manuscript before you send it to an agent, whether that's a beta reader, whether it's an author friend, and that's always a difficult question. That's a difficult thing to ask, like, can you please read my book? Because authors are very busy reading for themselves, reading proofs and so on. But if you are good friends with an author, you could you could approach them in a very polite way, uh, saying, you know, you totally understand if they can't do it. You probably should get feedback from someone, is what I'm saying, before you send it to an agent. If you can afford a freelance editor, I don't know what it costs these days, 300 quid, something like that, 500 bucks, then that can be good. But take their editorial comments with a pinch of salt. Like, <clears throat> often I think a good editor will find all the weak points in a book and they might make suggestions about how to fix those weak points. You as an author, your job is to look at all of those suggestions and you will probably realize that they have a point. The editor is correct that every single one of those points could be improved. Every single one of those problems is a genuine problem, but you might disagree with all of their suggestions on how to fix it. You might agree with some, you might disagree with others. So whatever comments you get back, whether it's from your dad or whether it's from uh, a, an author friend, a beta reader, a, a writing group, whatever it is, take all of those comments with a pinch of salt because it is your book. Like, be honest with yourself. If you agree with them that something needs work, and actually it means rewriting the whole book and the whole structure needs changing. If you agree that that needs to be done, then do it. Commit the work, commit the time. But if it's something where you vehemently disagree and you think this is this goes against the whole spirit of the story, stick to your guns. Stick to your guns. Okay, here's another thing. Just in general, when you if you go to a writing festival, if you go to a festival as a reader and you meet authors or you meet an agent, if you are submitting right now, be don't be a dick. Like be be kind, be empathetic, be reasonable, be professional, be businesslike, be a good person when you're doing this. If you are difficult to work with, if you've got a, like a crazy temper or if you're uh, rude or if you're really impatient or if you spread gossip or something that will get out and people will know that you're like that so be professional be a good person to work with um, publishing is kind of a team effort you know I consider my team to be my agent and my editors in various different countries plus all the salespeople and publicists and cover designers and everything else so it's a team effort you need to be a team player um, be 
try and always do the right thing and be known as someone who is good to work with. But in general, you can't really go wrong if you stick with guidelines, if you write the best book you can, stick with agent submission guidelines and be polite and reasonable if you have to kind of nudge people. Uh, but mainly, like, I think really the key to success is reading as much as you can, as widely as you can, for as long as you can, sacrificing other things to read, writing the best book you can, investing some time into your submission package, and then having some luck. And I wish you the very, very, very best of luck. The odds are difficult, but it can happen. Like I say, I want to reiterate this point. I have dozens, if not hundreds of friends now who are authors and all of them, I think all of them, if not 95% of them are slush pile finds. Their agents found their books in their slush piles. It's not about contacts, it's about writing great stories. And I wish you the very best of luck. This has been Will Dean, Forest author. I'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye.